This episode is brought to you by Tegas. Over the years of our partnership with Tegas, they have evolved from a pure expert network into a full company intelligence platform. Tegas streamlines the investment research process so you can get up to speed and find answers to critical questions on companies faster and more efficiently. The Tegas platform surfaces the hard to get qualitative insights, gives instant access to critical public financial data through BAMSEC, and helps you set up customized expert calls. It's all done on a single modern SaaS platform that offers 360 degree insight into any public or private company. As a listener, you can take Tegas for a free test drive by visiting tegas.co slash Patrick. And until 2023, every Tegas license comes with complimentary access to BAMSEC by Tegas, which makes it easy to search and analyze public company filings and transcripts. This episode is brought to you by Kensho Scribe, the trusted transcription provider for business. If you're not transcribing your audio and video into searchable, usable data, you're missing out. And transcription is faster and easier than you think. Scribe powers call transcription, closed captioning, and more with best-in-class accuracy, speed, and security. It's the chosen transcription service for all of S&P Global, including CapIQ Pro and clients like leading market intelligence platform Tegas. Scribe accurately transcribes messy, difficult audio, including company and product names, currencies, accents, and numbers. Challenge us with your hardest audio and see how we stack up. Visit scribefreetrial.com to unlock 150 minutes of free transcription today. That's scribefreetrial.com. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Matt Russell, and today we are breaking down the historic General Electric. Honestly, approaching this episode was a unique challenge. Today's GE barely resembles what was once the largest company in the world. So rather than purely focus on what's remaining, we decided to use a lens of then versus now. So to break down General Electric, I was joined by Josh Aguilar, GE analyst at Morningstar, an enthusiast on all things capital allocation. It's a theme we revisit throughout the conversation on GE's time as a conglomerate and its rise and fall. The story of GE has many chapters. The origin dates back to Thomas Edison in 1896. And while GE has been classified as an industrial business for a very long time, it really is hard to overlook the technological breakthroughs that they've introduced. The incandescent light bulb, the x-ray machine, the electric locomotive and commercial jet engine. The business really has had no shortage of historic products. But when Jack Walsh took over in 1981, he implemented a playbook that brought GE much praise over the coming decades. And Josh and I focused our conversation on the end of Welch's era until the present day. Now, if you'd like to hear more on the early years of General Electric, and particularly Thomas Edison, make sure to check out our newest Colossus teammate, David Senra, and his podcast, Founders. David conveniently dropped a new episode on Edison this week. And after my conversation, you'll hear a preview of that episode. So stay tuned for that after my conversation with Josh. Please enjoy this breakdown of General Electric. All right, Josh, welcome to Business Breakdowns. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. We have no shortage of text on General Electric. I think it's etched into American history between Edison, Jack Welch, Jeff Immelt. You have the full spectrum of what I consider to be celebrity leadership. What I think is the most interesting lens for us to use and to tackle General Electric is the lessons from the rise and fall, what was self-inflicted versus what was outside their control. Maybe we could just start at the top, taking a comparative lens. In 2000, GE was the largest company by market cap in the world, and today it's a fraction of that. Maybe you could just start out with giving us a sense of what GE actually looks like today, comparing that to what it was like at its peak. It would be an understatement to say that GE looks very different today than during its peak in 2000. As you alluded to, GE was worth nearly $600 billion or so 
Many of your listeners are going to remember that CEO Jack Welch was named manager of the century by Fortune. And he held what was then called the world's most admired company by that same publication and the most respected company by the Financial Times. GE was, in fact, the most valuable company. Flash forward today, gone are the days when a larger than life figure like Jack Welch would wax poetic of GE being the place where one's dreams could come true. And management was considered one of GE's structural competitive advantages. In preparation for this chat, I actually opened the 10K from 2000, some numbers that may be of interest to your listeners. In the five years, including 2000, or from 96 to 2000, GE shareholders benefited from a 30% total annual return on their investment. And in over two decades, they would have enjoyed a 23% total annualized return. Sales in 2000 rose then by 16% over the prior year to nearly $130 billion. To put things into context, GE this past year generated just over $74 billion in revenue. 15 of GE's top 20 businesses posted double-digit earnings increases. Cash flow from operations in 2000 rose to over $15 billion, which if you deduct for capex of about $2.5 billion, implied free cash of nearly $13 billion. To put things into context, GE last year didn't even clear $2 billion in free cash flow. The company used to pay out dividends of over $5.4 billion that year. Today, GE paid a token dividend in 2021 of $575 million. At the time, it was one of the most widely held stocks. Today, it's hard to convince potential investors to invest in GE's turnaround story, despite what we think is attractive undervaluation or one of the best industrial operators in Larry Culp. Finally, GE didn't know it at the time, but it wanted to get bigger with what ultimately was its failed merger attempt with Honeywell, whose market value today is nearly 16% than GE is today. What we're left with now is a remaining company that consists really of three businesses in aviation, healthcare, and energy, or what GE is calling Vernova, and what's left of related equipment financing from remaining GE capital now has it corporate, along with its insurance liabilities and the Polish mortgages denominated in Swiss francs. So gone today is NBC, gone is investment bank Kidder Peabody, gone are plastics, gone are appliances, gone are locomotive equipment, gone is its legacy lighting business which was closely associated with Thomas Edison, as you mentioned at the top. Most of GE Capital is gone, including GCAS and its PK Air Finance unit. Most of its oil and gas interest from the combination with Baker Hughes. Gone is GE Biopharma, which was sold to Danaher for over $20 billion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite the breakup of a conglomerate. As I was doing my research and thinking about just walking around downstairs, opening up a GE refrigerator, looking on television to see NBC, when you're getting on an airplane and there's a GE engine involved, healthcare devices, it was literally touching every part of your everyday life. Going back 20 years, that was a business that was also producing, to your point, massive amounts of free cash flow, earnings growth. What would you point to as being the driver or the inflection which resulted in this one-time powerful conglomerate losing all that power and a management team thinking that it was better off divesting many of those assets and becoming much more focused on very specific industries. It's going to sound cliche, but I'd say GE's problems could be pegged on two areas to answer the question. One is culture, and two is capital allocation. To a certain extent, they worked in tandem with one another. Welch's issues were really twofold. Short-termism at the cost of rational long-term decision-making Secondly, a failure to mitigate downside risk. And they went hand in hand through the use of GE Capital, which I think at one point constituted nearly 60% of GE's earnings at its height under Jeff Immelt. Welch used GE Capital as a vehicle for earnings management by essentially spackling over the industrial business's weak quarters. There's a book out there that alleges Jack Welch always advises direct reports or execs to keep a nickel in your pocket of earnings per share which at best translated to low quality of earnings. And in a worst case, one might say it was tantamount to financial engineering. And I leave that for your listeners to decide, but there's really no way a company can consistently beat earnings expectations like GE aimed to do every quarter into Welch without some real long-term adverse consequences. At first, GE's heavy reliance on GE capital, it seemed to make intuitive sense. Welch noticed it was a lot easier to make money in financial services than it was manufacturing large-scale industrial equipment. It's inherently, it being the industrial equipment, is inherently very capital-intensive and frequently involves booking of contract assets, which in accounting speak means that GE generally recognizes the sale of equipment long before it collects the rated cash. 
Furthermore, GE was like a bank, but it certainly wasn't regulated like one. And it could use its leverage and its then AAA credit rating to obtain its cost of funds cheaper, which it did by obtaining what's called wholesale funding. By the way, that's just jargon for saying short-term borrowing for the markets as opposed to raising money from deposits. The latter, which is comparably more expensive, and that's what banks do. That form of competitive advantage was illusory, but there's a catch. And it's something noted value investor Seth Klarman has reminded investors of. With leverage, you can blow up overnight. In financial services, firms have a history of both feast and famine. During famine, as was the case with the Great Recession in 2008, the market for short-term loans dried up as lenders fled, and GE simply didn't have much in the way of deposits to fall back on. GE was left without a source of funds, and yet a situation that was akin to a run of the bank for all you Jimmy Stewart fans. That left GE with only the government and a strongly capitalized firm like Berkshire Hathaway to turn to. Then came regulation, because of Welch's ill-begotten bet on financial services. And Elmo effectively failed to rein in and mitigate GE's risk of exposure. GE's capital short-term borrowings were an appreciable chunk of its assets, about a third or so from my recollection. The regulators quickly figured out that it just wasn't financial institutions like banks that were systematically important, but non-banks like GE Capital also formed part of this group. And GE started to become regulated like a bank under the newly created Dodd-Frank legislation of the time about mid-2016 when it was non-sci-fi as it shed most of its loans. Now you had a situation in the ensuing years after the crisis where GE was forced to operate with more capital. Using some simple DuPont analysis, returns on equity for financial services firms are a function of two variables. A, you've got the return companies can generate on their assets, like loans, and B, their assets to equity, which is unfavorable the more equity you're forced to hold. And gone were GE still as returns on equity as it was forced to hold more and more capital. Now, I think Jeff Immelt gets too much of a pass from other corners of the market. Keep in mind that Jeff Immelt was CEO of General Electric for about 16 years, which is materially longer than the median tenure of industrial CEOs nowadays. Yes, he had to deal with both 9-11, the Great Recession, among other challenges, but Immelt almost had an uncanny ability to buy high and sell low or just plainly waste precious shareholder capital. Just by way of example, and certainly not limitation, which is a favorite of lawyers like myself, GE sold NBC back in 2011 for an enterprise value of under $40 billion, which while not apples to apples, compared very unfavorably versus other cable deals like when AT&T bought Time Warner for roughly $110 billion. Emerald also spent more than $14 billion over 10 years on ill-time oil investments when he acquired companies that helped drillers pump and transport oil. GE's mostly exited out of any oil-related interest as it sold off most of its Baker Hughes interests. GE spent tens of billion dollars on share repurchase in Emerald's final three years and nearly doubled the levels the stock price ultimately fell to. The worst part of these transactions is that this precious capital could have gone a long way towards deleveraging and would have avoided GE having to sell exceptional businesses like GE Biopharma to bring down that leverage. And then Emil also spent mid-single-digit billions in its failed industrial IoT platform, which most people can't even pronounce whether it's Predix or Predix, parts of which were sold to private equity firm Silver Lake, most of which will be folded into the new energy company. GE also bought into WMC under Emil. That was a subprime and Alte mortgage lender in 2004. By the way, not only did GE sustain losses before it ultimately shuttered this business, but it was also forced to pay a civil penalty of $1.5 billion under the Ferreira statute for criminal fraud. Really, nothing's worse, and what he's probably going to be most remembered by, was leading the charge to buy turbine competitor Alstom as GE heralded the golden age of gas. The clients of the gas power market weren't completely unforeseeable. Siemens had actually been right-sizing capacity, while GE went in the opposite direction. In some ways, erosion of GE's culture under Immelt, in my view, contributed to this unfettered desire, and really the hubris, to make this transformative deal. And I really do credit Tom Greta, as a journalist, surfacing many of these insights. Immelt really, depending on who you believe, had an aversion to hear the bare case of anything he really wanted to pursue. And I think that's why folks found him likable, because ultimately that's what led him to be divorced from reality particularly as it pertained to the company's financial position and this insistence on overly rosy projections, like not fully appreciating the power segment's aggressive revenue recognition practices. Just to put a bow on this story, G bought Alstom for $10 billion net of cash, but took a near $22 billion impairment on the deal during the end of John Flannery's tenure. I've always said that's like throwing a bunch of money 
in aesthetic improvements into a condemned house. And yes, throughout GE's history, there's been plenty of things outside that control. There's been 9-11. There's been the Great Recession. There's been the global pandemic. But there's plenty of instances of self-inflicted pain. There's a lot to unpack there, but I think a few really interesting points, especially on ML relative to Welch. It's interesting to hear about ML's push, perhaps against the grain or going countercyclical or zigging while others are zagging. I know that at points in time, Jack Welch did similar things with RCA and selling the electronics business, also just cutting staff, but still growing revenues, doing some unorthodox things, but having success with those at the same time, ML not having the same success and quite the opposite, it seems like. Just to step back and retap into one of those earlier points you made on GE Capital, at its peak, you mentioned 60% of earnings. If you were to step back and analyze whether it was Welch's timeframe or paired together with MLT's, I think there was, again, a lot of text written on managerial strategies, a focus on being number one or two in each market, and how to operate this insanely efficient industrial conglomerate. How much is that the reality versus... This was just a business that was propped up by a bunch of leverage. And the reason it was such a valuable company was really that finance business doing much of the work. How would you separate those two stories and the fact and fiction in terms of that history and particularly Welch's time? It's a tough one really to disaggregate because it was a little bit before my time. But I'd say this, I really think it was mostly the latter, meaning that it was propped up quite a bit by GE Capital. You would not have had the success without GE Capital becoming the size it eventually became. And I think that was missed by investors for quite some time. It's hard to notice that when you're consistently beating earnings and you're generating the type of returns that GE was earning at the time in 2000. I think it's really mostly on GE Capital and I think it's less to do with managerial brilliance. I mean, if they had that managerial brilliance, arguably we wouldn't have run into the situation where we are now and GE losing that Facebook of value. It's something that I think we've seen the market can miss over and over again. The Berkshire insurance business is drastically different than the GE capital business. You could see when good financial operations are effectively run as part of a broader organization and all the benefits that those can bring. But as you mentioned with leverage, that can quickly change overnight if it's run inefficiently. You talked a little bit about the return profile. Once you start getting regulated like a bank or once you start operating like a bank, we talked a lot about this in our Charles Schwab episode, it drastically changes what the return profile of the business looks like. If we flash forward to where we are today, you mentioned the new management team in place, their focus. Maybe talk a little bit about the remaining businesses today, and we can go through them each individually. Some of these have long histories as being part of GE. Talk a little bit about the strategy that they're operating with today and which businesses they're keeping inside the umbrella of General Electric and why they might be keeping those specifically. At this point, GE is focused on three businesses, aviation, healthcare, and energy, which can be broken down into power, renewables, and digital grid. An advantage that GE has is that it competes in oligopolistic markets. To a certain extent, all these businesses try to focus a little bit on the same thing, and that is build a large install base of equipment to sell higher margin parts and service revenue. Let's start with aviation, which is probably the best example of this, and really the most important of GE's businesses today, which is what shareholders will be left with after GE spins healthcare here in early 2023 and energy in early 2024. Normal times, I'd say this business is probably a mid-single digit organic grower with 20% op margins through the cycle, give or take. My model is a good deal higher in terms of near-term growth just because of the pent-up demand that we continue to anticipate. We're expecting double-digit revenue growth in commercial aero over the next couple of years with a margin recovery from operating leverage in this business. For commercial aerospace, which is the majority of GE's mix in aviation, GE has a joint venture with Saffron in the narrow body space, and that sells the market-leading Leap engine. That engine is single-sourced, meaning it's the only engine that Boeing uses in its 737 MAX, and it's dual sourced in the Airbus A320neo family, which is in competition with Pratt & Whitney's GTF engine. Narrow bodies, which are the single aisle jets, are increasingly important because they can increasingly travel long distances. 
the Airbus A321 XLR, which is Airbus's extra long jet, can travel 4,300 nautical miles, which is the distance from London to Miami. Ultimately, I don't think there's any one company in the world that competes effectively with G and its ability to deliver engines reliably at scale. And in the wide body space, product offerings like the GE9X compete against Rolls Royce. This is a true razor and blade business. GE sells these engines at a loss to make it up in highly profitable parts and service revenue, which provides it with multi-decade benefits. It's a key reason we think aviation deserves this wide moat. Just to frame this, assume the list price of a Leap engine is about $14 million. Customers, which are the carriers, your American Airlines, or your air framers like Boeing, they routinely pay 70% below list price. And as the years go by, these discounts are known to be reduced over time as the engine proves itself out. But we think they hover over 50% off list price. Now, on the services side, we think about half are sold via time of materials, while the other half is sold through what's called flight hour services agreements. You can call it power by the hour. You can call it CSAs or contract services agreement. It's all the same thing. The latter means it's on the OEM like GE to maximize on-wing time. But the trade-off you get a steadier stream of cash flows versus a time and material setup. Drivers in this business are PKs, revenue passenger miles, revenue passenger kilometers, same thing, depending which unit of measurement. Really, it's a function of global passenger traffic and the distance traveled for the original equipment side. On the aftermarket side, it's more about cycles driven. RPKs themselves are driven, in our view, by factors like middle income growth in developing markets. So healthcare, GE's second most important business, which is going to spin in early 2023. So the heavy equipment like MRIs, X-ray, ultrasounds, and so forth. It's been adding some digital capabilities and in artificial intelligence and machine learning that improves patient outcomes and workflow automation, which cuts down on caretaker wasted time, particularly as we have some physician shortages. Customers here are your hospitals and your outpatient centers. In addition to some of the investments GE Healthcare is making, I think some underappreciated catalysts include the potential for a dividend payment, since healthcare companies typically pay out maybe 35 to 60% of their earnings out in dividends, an opportunity for bolt-on M&A for burgeoning startups in the space, because this is a really dynamic space. In healthcare, I'd call that a solid lower mid-single-digit grower, and it should generate high teens op margins through the cycle. It's also the best free cash flow converter at about 100% of free cash flow earnings. So drivers for this business include an aging population, greater access to care, growing chronic conditions and surgical procedures, physician shortages, among other things. Then this is an oligopoly with the likes of Siemens Health and Ears, Philips, and to a lesser extent, Canon X Toshiba. And then Vernova, that's the last business, competes with mostly Vestas and Siemens Energy on the renewable side of the business, while Power competes with mostly Siemens Energy and Mitsubishi heavy equipment, and to a lesser extent, CAT as well. Renewables are arguably less oligopolistic, but there's a bit of a regional divide and competitive dynamic Chinese players, though, include Goldwyn and Ming Yang. Drivers and renewables include the energy transition and the production tax credit cycle. You hear a lot about GE talk about the PTC in the U.S., which impacts when projects are ultimately financed by utilities. I see this business possibly growing high single digits on the renewable side, but not really breaking even until the middle part of the decade. I'm really, really skeptical of management's long-term target here. And I think they underappreciate some of the competitive risks here. And then for power, should really benefit from the energy transition as a bridge the gap technology as the world moves to renewables, given the intermittency issues, which is a problem batteries can't correct given the size and constraints. Just to add some additional dynamics, aviation, longest cycle business of the bunch, meaning it takes longest to fill orders. Healthcare, shorter mid-cycle business, meaning it takes about a year to fill unfilled orders based on the backlog burn rates I've calculated. So that's the business today. You mentioned there's plans to spin that healthcare business. If I just step back and think about these businesses together, there's not many natural operating synergies. You're not dealing with the same customer base that you can necessarily cross-sell to. Perhaps at a corporate level, obviously, there's some below-the-line G&A expenses that you could save on. Maybe you're diversifying your earning cyclicality, to your point, in terms of different cycle sale time and the way that these things fluctuate. It just appears that there was a decision made that the conglomerate structure was not going to work. Maybe you could tap into that a little bit more. Is this just simply the market valuing these businesses individually at higher levels and seeing that based on what you're seeing market multiples at? Are there other drivers in the decision to really split up this business and end the conglomerate era? 
you mentioned diversification, and I'd say GE lost the right to remain as a conglomerate a long time ago. Buffett talks about this in his letters to shareholders with Berkshire Hathaway. The whole value proposition of a conglomerate is that you can have tax-free movement of capital, but that only matters really if you can allocate capital better than the market. You only have to look at the stock price over the long run to know that G really hasn't been successful at doing that. That's just a symptom of the problem, right? The breakup, we think, really should allow G to be a lot more focused, given each of these businesses' very different investment profiles and capital allocation needs. Of course, it's an important catalyst to re-rate the stock in line with peers. When you flash back, you mentioned the NBC sale, and they've been basically selling off assets for north of a decade at this point. Was that sale, and you can use other sales as well, obviously it wasn't made from a position of strength. But when you look at what was driving those sales, was it leverage issues and dealing with liquidity? Was it market multiples and the dynamics of taking advantage of where there might be a mismatch? Would they have made those sales if they were operating from a position of strength, do you think? This was a little bit before my time, but just my take on this is Immolt was trying to refocus the company and get back to the roots of being an industrial conglomerate. Really, GE had just gotten massive, and there really is no inherent structural advantage to managerial excellence. NBC wasn't really core to what he saw GE looking like in the future. His big initiative was really, can we make this a software industrial type company, which is actually all the rage nowadays. But he was just early and just his vision was bigger than the reality. I think GE was able to operate with it. And I mean, when you look at Predicts, it wanted to be all things to every industrial, whereas a lot more of these IoT offerings nowadays and some of the industrial companies that I cover, they were more focused on things that they have domain expertise in, which is just industry jargon of saying the businesses that they're actually playing in. Was it from a position of strength? Clearly not. I don't think it was a rush like GE had to deal with in the Flannery and Larry Culp years because... A lot of the problems that surfaced under Immolt really weren't known till the end of Immolt's tenure or weren't really fully appreciated and on to John Flattery and Larry Culp taking over. You brought up capital allocation a few times now in a variety of different ways, dividend, M&A. When you look at the business today from CapEx perspective, from the dividend, from the potential for free cash flow inflection, what does that look like moving forward, whether you want to factor in the spinoff of the companies, however is best to frame that. I understand there's a lot of moving parts, but I'd be curious to think about that and would be curious to compare it to how capital was allocated in the early 2000s, if there's anything interesting to learn there. I'd say right now, the difference is there's an emphasis on organic investment. If you think about where they're putting that capital to work, think about the RISE program, for example, the commercial aerospace, we're looking at sustainable engines. And one of the things that GE is looking at with their partner, Saffron, is towards the middle of the 2030s decade, developing the sustainable engine, removing the nacelle or the covering, having an unducted fan. That I think is really interesting. There's going to be quite a bit of R&D and organic investment that goes that way. I think on the healthcare side, we're looking at artificial intelligence, machine learning, and any of the digital offerings that GE is increasingly investing in which I think is also an interesting route in investment. And then on the renewable side, offshore wind is a large investment right now, not profitable, but growing certainly very strongly. I think in terms of share repurchases, the authorizations for about $3 billion, I'd like to see them use that just given the stock's price to value ratio at this point. And then dividends, each company is going to have their own dividend policy. Certainly, I would expect that the healthcare company, just given the strength of its free cash flow generation, Again, we talked about that 100% free cash flow conversion. Healthcare companies typically pay out, this is just off the top of my head, 35 to 60% of their earnings in dividends. Industrial companies, maybe that number is mid-teens to 50% or so. I'd expect a stronger dividend there just given the investment cycles of the industrial businesses. And then acquisitions. I would expect that healthcare participates meaningfully in the bolt-on space. There's a lot of rising competition from early stage competitors. I think that's an interesting space. They've been adding some of these things. BK Medical is one such example. I expect them to increasingly do this over time. Yeah, it's very interesting because I think I still am stuck in the yesteryear of General Electric, where I think about everything being under one roof and capital allocation being thought of that way and just having one almost centralized thought process to operating the conglomerate. Was the management style 
always done in a centralized way or were these decentralized strategies towards allocating capital, understanding the industry cycles factored in? Now, obviously, the dividend policy is going to come from the centralized companies. So that's one thing. Do you have a sense of what that looked like culturally from a centralized versus decentralized standpoint? I would actually say that GE was like the poster child of centralized management and really why it doesn't work in my view. It's kind of the opposite of Berkshire, right? You think of Berkshire as the ultimate decentralized business. I think Buffett talks about trust to the point of abdication, right? Of responsibility. G under Larry Culp is moving under that direction, making sure that the businesses are really responsible and they become the center of gravity, taking on some of these, what were traditionally shared expenses and they're taking them on their own P&L and really looking at each of the businesses from their bottoms up and looking at the different P&Ls they're all responsible for this. We didn't even talk about this, the lean implementation, the focus on safety, quality, delivery, and cost. They're all having to hold responsibility for that. And I think that's the trend it's moving towards. But absolutely, before, GE was really well known for homegrowning their managers. And particularly once you get to a big enough size, I just don't think that model works. Yeah, it seemed to be certainly a model. I think even when you hear about managers and spending two to three years in a specific business unit and moving on to the next business unit. It was something that in our Exxon Mobil breakdown, they talked a lot about that being a similar structure. It certainly is not the style that's used by many of the companies that are in the spotlight today. So it's interesting to see whether that's just a secular change or there's a cyclical nature to the centralized versus decentralized thing. I think Buffett's always one to look at in terms of If he's been doing it for this extended period of time, there might be something rooted in place that makes that work. Charlie Munger has talked about this before too. He's propensity to always move managers around. And I think that's a shortfall. I contrast that with another business I cover, Rupert Technologies. They keep their managers in place for a long period of time because the minute that you rotate these folks around, you lose that management competence in one specific area. And that's a mistake that GE still makes, I think, to this day. Yeah, especially when you factor in cycles. Three years is nearly enough to see cycles, especially after the past 10 years of what we've seen. In terms of the energy business, it does seem like an interesting shift. And it might just be shifting with the world in terms of where the world is moving, green, and a focus on more environmentally friendly energy. It seems like, from the impression I'm getting, General Electric has really focused solely on that area of the market. Is that right? And what do you think drives that? Because I think there is a case to be made that even while some of the old fossil fuel energy may be in a decline phase for an extended period of time, it's still starting at 65% of energy today, still coming from fossil fuels and that likely being a slow bleed. So what drives their decision to go after more environmentally friendly and turn their back on what could be a longer life, but slow decline fossil fuel business? They still sell through the power portfolio business. They do still sell turbines that are exposed to nuclear and they stopped the new coal build, but they are focusing on servicing that business still. So there's still some of that, but you're absolutely right. They are skating towards that area. I think they are just skating to where the puck is going, so to speak. There's demand with the energy transition. So some pretty strong growth drivers there. They bought that business. I'm thinking back again, this is before my time, but I think they bought that business from the Enron years and early 2000s, that access to the technology that they have there, that's an area of focus for them. That's how I think about it. The problem is, I think we've alluded to this, it's just not been, particularly on the wind turbine side of things, been very profitable. Just to put things into context here, Matt, recently it had been earning the negative mid-single digit margins on the op margin side. In the last couple quarters, we're now looking at negative mid-teens. And that's been really because the PTC dynamics partly, but other price competition too. That, to your point, is not going to get any easier over time. Right now, I've talked about this regional divide and conquer, but the Chinese competitors, which I think are underappreciated risk on the part of GE, they're coming from what my understanding. That's a business that I think is going to continue to be tough for them. Can you talk a little bit about the dynamics there and how the margin profile actually plays out? So whether decreased pricing, but what are the costs associated with that and what could potentially result in that inflecting higher? Just understanding how that business actually works would be useful. It's not something I'm entirely familiar with. Let me just break down the 
competitive dynamic. Renewables, really, there's a divide and conquer geographic dynamic. The reason that's been the case is because the primary components like your blades, your towers, and your nacelles, they're tough to ship overseas for outside competitors. Competitors outside of North America still have to move that equipment by truck or rail to interior portions of the U.S. That's really expensive. There's also some product complexity relative to solar panels. And developers and financiers are generally more comfortable with homegrown turbine manufacturers. Unfortunately for GE, that dynamic is beginning to change. So there's that competition aspect, which I think will put pressure on pricing. But also really the production tax credit cycle, that's really what drives that business. They have to right size to their new reality. Some of that is just they've got in the backlog some business that they've underwritten and they just have to right size for the new reality. That's going to take some time taking costs out of the business. I think we're going to see a lot more focus now from Scott Strasick, who's been placed in charge and did a good job with helping to turn around that power business. And it's now looking like it'll be like a mid single digit off margin business. The thesis really here is just, can you stem the bleeding and get to break even and just run this business where you can eke out some marginal profitability? That's what we're looking for there. If you compared it to the aviation business where they're selling some piece of hardware, we'll just use simple terms, and then making the bulk of profit on the servicing of that hardware. Is it the same in the turbine business, but just pressured because of competition and a less strong demand side of the market? Is it the same revenue model, though, in terms of hardware plus service revenue? There's hardware plus service revenue, but it's not nearly as much service revenue. In aviation, the investment justifies the parts and service revenue. You've got multiple decades worth of that. That's not really the case in renewables. On the surface, it seemed like it would be a very similar profile, but maybe the competition would be what pressed the hardware and the service side of things. It doesn't always work. Think about LED lighting, right? It resolved the light bulb maintenance cycle. With aerospace engines, they're really complex. There's a lot of service requirements because you've got FAA oversight. You don't want planes falling out of the sky. There's a lot more, again, parts and service revenue involved with that business. That's a multi-decade benefit tailwind for GE. On the surface level, sometimes these things look like they can be applicable to other industries or segments of an existing business, but there's usually frictions or details that explain why it works in one and doesn't work in the other. Your coverage extends beyond General Electric. And I'm curious, just in having this entire conversation about conglomerates, centralized versus decentralized, what failed to work for General Electric. And we can apply a lot of that, it sounds like, to GE Capital and a decent amount of it to the management team's decisions outside of that as well. But when you think about conglomerates just as a piece of the market, and whether it's your industry or even thinking at a higher level of what will work in the future, do you expect conglomerates to be at the top of global market caps in the future? It seems like we have a lot of businesses that are entirely focused on single products or single markets now. I'd just be curious for your opinion on whether that becomes back in focus and becomes the cultural norm in the future again. The pendulum does tend to swing over time. I would say that trend towards deconglomeratization will not change. I do not think the market caps of these companies, they're not going to grow over time. Unless you think that each of the individual components by becoming more focused and being on their own, there, I think, is a winning formula. Depends on your point of view. I don't think they'll be like GE, where they're an end-all, be-all to everything. What you will see is more focused conglomerates. Think about Raytheon Technologies, when it spun off Otis, it spun off Carrier, merged in the commercial side with UTX and Raytheon. You'll see more of that. And I think that's a more winning formula. And again, the market, it's a much more understandable business model. People like the pure play investors can diversify for themselves. You're not going to have this situation where different businesses are competing for capital, which I think is a poor formula for success. There's this trend towards deconglomeratization, and I don't think it'll end over time. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting theme. And you go back and look at when the conglomerates were so in focus and there was so much written about the benefits and the synergies and all of this. And today, it's easy to poke holes in pretty much all of that. And I think you went through a pretty good list there. We wrap up the conversation usually talking about upside cases, downside cases. 
I think you've alluded to the bull case and the potential for that aviation business to have success and with the spinoffs of the healthcare, a little bit more operational focus in each of these. Is there anything else that you would add there in terms of what could drive major upside and GE and maybe shifting the tone on the story? And obviously, it's still a substantial market cap, a substantial business in the market, but anything that can add some shine to this business again? You really hit on the two points. What people tend to underappreciate is that the commercial aerospace and RPKs or revenue passenger kilometers tend to be coupled with GDP per capita trends. And that's been decoupled. And that's because of the COVID lockdowns, right? What we're seeing is there's this pent up demand for global passenger travel. And people are now moving from products towards experiences, even on food equipment and the restaurant end user. You're seeing people more and more eating out. That will benefit air travel as well. And it's going to surprise some people, I think. That business has a high degree of operating leverage. There's a good degree of fixed costs, and you'll see incremental margin drop down to the bottom line. I think these businesses will re rate. It may take some time, certainly. I think there's deal limbo and bet in the price. People will be surprised how better to run there on their own and just being able to choose your own capital allocation policies. Those are the things that I think are the upside scenario case, but you hit on the two points I'd highlight too as well. And you talked about re rating. I'm curious, how does the market? value these businesses? Is it a simple P multiple or are there other nuances that are added into it? I don't think the market gives full credit for how these businesses should trade individually. I think what people are focused on right now is a few things. All the the problems that they've had. I think there's been some capitulation. There's also just some fear too with deal limbo embedded in the price where people are saying renewables is having a lot of problems. Perhaps the spins aren't going to take the time and place in the manner that she is prescribed here. The conversation of the debate and the valuation debate is a lot more dominated by fear. And there's just a concern that these businesses will never earn the same normalized earning power that the market expects or that the more bulls expect. That makes a lot of sense. And I think you hit on the risks quite well there. To wrap up the conversation, we always talk about the lessons learned. I think we've gone through a lot of the lessons in the conversation. So that was the lens of the conversation. But I guess just in your own personal experience, when you started looking at GE to where you are today, what have been the main takeaways for you? Maybe the biggest surprises versus what you had expected going into the analysis? When I started off looking at this business, I didn't like what I saw. I think it changed over time with new management. GE's always had great world-class assets, but I think it needed the management team to achieve that closing of the price value gap. Larry Culp was making all the right moves in terms of getting more lean and more focused in that sense. The lessons learned, I'd really say, kind of amount to how far hubris can take you. And Buffett talks about this with the institutional imperative. There was this belief and almost an arrogance to not see the downside risks of pursuing certain things. I think that's really important. You're going to want an intellectual environment where someone can present the alternative point of view and surface what are the downside risks to making any sort of decision. Also, just the element of what's important to be really focused, that is greater than the benefits from any synergies from having centralized research center. That's a great recap there. You mentioned Munger before. He often talks about looking at the business failures and just not doing what they did. And sometimes that can be just as beneficial seeing where companies went wrong rather than just the companies that are at the peak of their powers in the moment. So I always love covering these businesses that have gone through some turmoil and shakeup and GE falls into that category. Thanks a lot, Josh. This was an excellent conversation. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. So this is where he starts work at 12 years old. This is actually going to change his life. So, okay, he's going to actually save a young, he's going to work on the railroad. He's going to work on a train. And the reason, and I'll get to this in a minute, but the reason this job that he gets at 12 is going to change his life is because he's going to save a young boy's life. I think the kid was like three years old. Uh, He was like on a train track and Edison winds up grabbing him before he could be hit by a train. And in return, I think it's the station master's son, if I'm remembering this correctly. The station master is like, how can I ever repay you? Thank you so much. And he teaches Edison how to operate a telegraph. And why is that important? Because Edison's first experiments were how to make a telegraph better. It may, this may sound stupid to you and I or like silly to you and I, but at this point in history, the telegraph is the leading edge of communication technology in the entire world. 
the best description, in case you don't know what it is, it's just a point-to-point -point text messaging system. So instead of sending a letter by horse that gets there three, three, you know, three months later, and then maybe you get a response six months after that, you can send a message immediately. If you were a young person interested in the cutting edge of technology at this point in history, you would have worked on the telegraph. So we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, he learned that there would be a job on the daily train for a newsboy. So he's selling newspapers and then he's selling like food and sweets to the passengers. He was only 12. And this is the beginning of these extremely long hours at work that he maintains his entire life. He would leave at dawn and the young boy would return uh, to home at 10 or 11 at night. And so this is the first example of a young Edison's relentless resourcefulness. There's all these times where he's like he's riding a train all day long. He has to get off and switch trains. And sometimes there's like this long layover, right? And so what does he do? He's constantly into in and out of Detroit. And he realizes, hey, I have a, a several hour layover every day uh, in Detroit. And there's this fantastic library. And this is the what I was referencing to you earlier. In Detroit, during the hours of layover, he found his way to the public library. This is Edison describing this point in his life. My refuge was the Detroit Public Library. I started with the first book on the bottom shelf and went through the lot one by one. I did not read a few books. I read the library. And so when I got to this section, it made me think of this, what, I call, what I've told you over and over again. I hope you've watched it. Have you watched, I hope you watched it five times by now. What I feel is the best talk on YouTube for entrepreneurs is by uh, the investor Bill Gurley. It is called Running Down a Dream, How to Succeed and Thrive in a Career You Love. I will leave a link in the show notes. Anytime I say, hey, there's something in the show notes, it's in the show notes in your podcast player. It's also available at founderspodcast.com, okay? I will leave a link for the full video in the show notes. I will also leave Blake Robbins' incredible notes on Bill Gurley's talk. And I'm going to read from those notes right now. This is the section that came to mind when I read this part. Bill Gurley says, greatness isn't random, it is earned. If you're going to research something, this is your lucky day. Information is freely available on the internet. That's the good news. The bad news, and this is why I think the, the this um, I think this video is so important for entrepreneurs and founders to to watch and listen to over and over again, because it just holds you to a higher standard. He goes into great detail how bad people want, and like there's five examples how bad these people want the dreams that they that they're going after. And this talk also helped shape my approach to founders. And so let me start this part over. Greatness isn't random, it is earned. If you're gonna research something, this is your lucky day. Information is freely available on the internet. That's the good news. The bad news is now you have zero excuse for not being the most knowledgeable in any subject you want because it's right there at your fingertips. That is something Thomas Edison knew instinctively. He is 12 years old? Yeah, 12 years old this time. And he's like, all right, cool. I got access to the library. I'll read every single book. That's something he does throughout his entire life. I have a bunch of, I'm pretty sure I'll get to him. I have a bunch of highlights. He just does this over and over again. And when, you know, he's studying a million different fields of study and he's just like, okay, where can I start? He was extremely big on experimenting, but before he experimented, he would just, you would just see him laying out on the floor with like 50 books on the subject. He's like, I'll just read everything. So let's go back to this fact that he's on this train. He's got this job. Now this is a few years later. And again, resourcefulness. He's like, well, I'm selling somebody else's newspaper for like a quarter. Why don't I just make my own? So he says he undertook the venture of editing, printing, and selling a small local newspaper, which was produced in his baggage car. He sold it for eight cents a copy and had a circulation of about 400 people. It was said to have been the first newspaper in the world that was published on a train. So that was the good idea. It's like, okay, instead of selling somebody else's product, I can just make my own. Here's the bad idea. He allowed another person to influence the direction. So he starts printing like personal stories of people in the industry because his friend convinced him that it would sell more. The problem is Edison's like a 15 year old country boy. He doesn't know too much about human nature yet. And so this is what happens to him. One of these candid little stories touched on a local figure. This proved to be excessively candid. And so the person he's writing about did not like the fact that his business was put for everybody to read. And he says, I'm going to find this Edison kid and I'm going to extract my vengeance. So now this is a grown man, a grown adult attacking and beating the hell out of a 15 year old kid. One day the man sighted the young editor near the docks. He laid violent hands on him and then threw him into the river. Shortly after Edison closed down that operation, this is the event that changes his life that I referenced earlier. Uh, Edison noticed that the three-year-old son of the station match master was playing uh, right on the main track in the path of the car. He dashed towards the child and snatched him up in order, in time to avoid the car. Uh, the guy's name was Mackenzie. Mackenzie was filled with such gratitude and expressed a desire to repay him in any manner within his power. He had noticed that Edison hung over his telegraph table constantly. He offered to teach the boy to be an operator. 
that is really important because even if he fell back and he made jokes about his life, obviously later on he's much wealthier than he is now, but he's like, oh, worst case scenario, I can always be a telegraph operator for 75 bucks a month. It's almost akin to being like a programmer today. So it says uh, with him, within him, within Edison, that is, there is a passionate curiosity to learn certain things. So what they're talking about is like as soon as they start teaching him the telegraph, he had a hard time getting him up from it. He says he works alone at his experiments for long hours and enjoys himself uh, heartily. And so most of these telegraph operators are young men. They really, the the note I left myself here is the telegraph operators were the digital nomads of their day. So it says Edison could find work almost anywhere because the need for telegraphers was so urgent during the Civil War. Uh, These were his wandering years that began when he was only 16. In those days, the strange new tribe of telegraphers were generally young men uh, noted for the nomadic or bohemian habits. They would travel light, pitching their tents for a brief season in one place, and then journeying on to another that seemed to offer greater pastures. A few steady young operators rose from the ranks to become industrial magnates, like Andrew Carnegie, because that's what one of the first jobs Carnegie had, and I think he was around 12 at the time, too. So not only do, are they making good money for their, for their age and the, their time, uh, their trade is in high demand, and also, they didn't really need much because they just hop a train. And in many cases, they were like trying to sleep in the offices where their telegraphs were. So that's another trait that Edison would use his entire life. He would just fall asleep wherever, whether he was in New York trying to build out the electrical system, right? Or he's in Menlo Park. He'd just sleep where, like he'd go to the corner and just fall asleep. Fall asleep in a chair, on a table. He just didn't really care. So for the next few years, he becomes obsessed with the telegraph. This is the electric telegraph. So remember, there is no electrical lighting before him. This is like the cutting edge of electric. Like if you have an electrical industry, it's manifested most pronounced, like it's most pronounced manifestation is in the telegraph. And so he's just sitting there constantly getting better at it, constantly thinking of ways to improve uh, the telegraph. The reason that's important is because what he's focused on now leads him to everything else that happens in his life after. The germs of many ideas and strategies perfected by him in later years were implanted in his mind when he worked at the telegraph. He described this phase of his life afterward. His mind was in a tumult, he said. It was besieged by all sorts of ideas and schemes. The future potential of electricity obsessed him day and night. It was then that he dared to hope that he would become an inventor. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 